always cheerful, always laughing, just a wonderful, wonderful uh, person. Anyway, I wanted to show you this, and I'll read it out to you, because, of course, the problem we've got, and, and Tony referred to it about the press, this is a poem from 1782 by William Cooper, and it says, How shall I speak of thee or thy power address, thou God of our idolatry, the press? By thee, religion, liberty, and laws exert their influence and advance their cause. By thee, worse plagues than Pharaoh's land befell, diffuse make earth the vestibule of hell. Doesn't that sound like the media? And then it says, thou f I love this part, thou fountain at which drink the good and wise, thou ever bubbling spring of endless lies. Yeah. Isn't that a beautiful turn of phrase? He said, like Eden's dead probationary tree, knowledge of good and evil is from thee. So this problem with the media, of course, has been around for, for uh, some time. As Tony was saying, um, the, the idea that the end of the world is coming has been about for a long time. Um, Tony and I agree about Michael Crichton and his comments, and of course his book, State of Fear, uh, which was uh, all about a, a green group exploiting climate change. And if any of you have read it, it's well worth reading again, State of Fear. The science in it was climate science in it was very accurate. The reason was that Michael Crichton shared a room with Richard Lindzen at Harvard. Okay, that's one of those interesting historical connections that ties things. But here's what he said. And this is a, I have to give a speech at the uh, Commonwealth Club in San Francisco in 2003. He said, I've been asked to talk about what I consider the most important challenge facing mankind, and I have a fundamental answer. The greatest challenge facing mankind is the challenge of distinguishing reality from fantasy, truth from propaganda. Perceiving the truth has always been a challenge to mankind, but in the information age, or as I think of it, the disinformation age, it takes on a special urgency and importance. And I think that that's a very good summary of what we're confronted with. And by the way, I mentioned earlier, having been involved in the Cuban crisis and flying with weapon loads down towards Cuba and so on, the person that discovered the Russian missiles in Cuba, the two years before he died, he said, so would you like to be in the business today? And he said, absolutely not. He said, they can Photoshop, they can create images that there's no way of detecting that it's false. Okay, so that's the, that's what Crichton is talking about, and of course what we're confronted with. We're very symbolic creatures. <laughs> Symbols like the Eiffel Tower, like the power of Parliament buildings, all sorts of flags. Very, very important symbolism. This picture symbolically started the environmental movement. Because suddenly, and some of you might remember, it showed up in the in the books in school. You know, spaceship Earth, the blue marble. But this suddenly allowed to play into the field that this is a very small, finite planet and that the humans could mess it up very easily. That was the concept that, that generated out of this. And of course, it was a paradigm shift. That is, that here was a new idea. And what happens with paradigm shifts is the first people that grab it and see the idea see political and financial opportunities in it. The majority of people are saying, well, it's a good idea, but how far do we go with it? And then what brings the uh, paradigm to an end are extremists saying silly things, which then allows the, the majority to say, oh, no, now you're going too far. So it defines. We are on the verge of environmentalists destroying environmentalism. That's one of the great dangers that we're in right now. It's the old cry wolf thing. And by the way, one of the things that I mentioned Darwin earlier, and I'll just tell you a very quick little story. I, I love to get my students on the edge of their chair, you know, just, just mm -hmm. and, and I, I said something very outrageous, and a student blurted out, I don't believe you. And of course, the class just went silent, and they were, you could see it on their faces. That's it. He's done. The red pencil sword of Damocles will descend upon him. <laughs> and I let them calm down, and I said, what don't you believe, Thomas? <laughs> and he said, my name isn't Thomas. <laughs> and then I said, in a class of 300, how many of you know the reference? <laughs> Five students. And then I said, how many of you go to church or been to church? About 12? 
about 12 people in a class of 300. So one of the things that's happened, of course, is that the religion has gone out of their lives, but they've replaced it with the new religion, which is environment. Environmentalism has effectively taken on the form of a religion. And I love this cartoon about First Church of Our Lady of the Environment. <laughs> so, so that's another side of it uh, that, that uh, we need to think about. Um, the position we're in today, Malthus didn't start it, but it was his idea that started it. And he took this very basic idea that the population would outgrow the food supply. He was completely wrong. The examples he used were, were terrible. He used the United States, for example, and then ignored the fact that the U.S. was under a massive immigration situation. Um, but nonetheless, this is the idea. Darwin took that essays on population with him on the Beagle. And he said, this is the book that influenced my thinking about the evolutionary theory more than any other single book. Okay, and this is an important part of this whole theme. Because Darwin had a cousin who he talked to all the time by the name of Galton, and Galton is the guy that started using the word eugenics first, the first person to talk about eugenics. Okay, and you, you think about that, and of course, the idea that the world is too many people, it's overpopulated, and, and Tony referred to that. Well, the... Um, yeah. Paul Ehrlich that Tony talked about, of course, was the person that picked up on this. We're going to run out of this. We're going to, uh, the world just can't survive anymore. And uh, exploited it and made some absolutely ridiculous. What amazes me is he's still got any credibility at all. Because surely if your forecasts are wrong, you got to say your, your science and your basics are wrong. Um, but what happened was, a guy by the name of Julian Simon, and you see the book up on the top right there called The Bet, he challenged uh, Ehrlich to a bet, and he said, you name any 10 minerals you want, any length of time period you want, and I'll bet you at the end of that time, there'll be more of that mineral at a lower cost than there is right now. Ehrlich took the bet and never paid up, even though Simon was correct. He was eventually shamed into paying up. But he, he got this guy to pick out the minerals for him. This guy is John Holdren, who is now the science czar in the Obama White House. Okay? And Holdren was writing a book in his 1977 with, with Ehrlich called Population Resources and Environment. So Holdren, of course, has been behind all of this. He's the guy that created the word polar vortex and all of these scary terms that got out to the media and so on. But I want to show you. Uh, I'll read this out again for you at the back there. It says, this is a quote from the 1977 book. It says, indeed, it has been concluded that compulsory population control laws, even including laws requiring compulsory abortion, could be sustained under the existing constitution if the population crisis became sufficiently severe to endanger the society. Now, I want to break this down for you because this is very important. This is how these people slide these things through. Because you now you say, oh, the constitution allows it. Oh, well, then it must be all right. But nobody says, indeed, it has been concluded. Who concluded? Yeah. They did it. Yeah. Right? They set up the straw man. And then he goes on to say, if the population crisis became sufficiently severe, who decides it's sufficiently severe? They do. So they create the problem, and then they determine when the problem needs to be dealt with, and then they'll say, well, we're sorry, we have to force abortions. Right. It's, it's a classic circular argument of the left, and you see it throughout this whole environmental and climate uh, issue. So Malthus population went out through food supply. The Club of Rome come in in, in 1968 and say the population will outgrow all of the resources. And it's there where you've got terms like peak oil and all of that stuff coming in. We're, run, we're running out of resources. We've we got to stop. And it creates some very strange bedfellows. Okay, for example, the peak oil thing. 
the oil companies were pushing it, saying, oh, yeah, peak oil. Yeah. Oh, oh, we're we're going to have to charge you more because there's less oil and it's harder to get. And we're going to charge you more. And then the environmentalists are saying, well, we should stop using the fossil fuels because it's running out anyway. So it fulfilled that old comment that politics makes strange bedfellows in, in that particular instance. Limits to growth, of course, was, remember I mentioned earlier about simple linear trends. This was the first time computer models were used to say how much resource have we got, how much of it is being used at what rate, and then predict when we run out of it. That's what early used to say, oh, you know, Britain will be dead, gone by 2000. It, it, it's just grossly simplistic examples. The irony of it all, of course, is that if you allow development, the population declines naturally. This is, called the, this is called the demographic transition. And so what happens is as a country becomes more wealthy, developed, and they, they are less worried about pensions and children and everything else, the number of children per family starts to decline quite dramatically. And although you're hearing about overpopulation in all these countries in the world, a lot of the countries have got the other problem. They haven't got enough people being uh, produced. Okay, some of them are offsetting it with migration. That was Germany's problem. German were, Germany was bringing in Turkish workers because there weren't enough Germans being born to do the work. Italy is now paying families to have a third and fourth child. Quebec is paying Quebecers to have a third and fourth child. But they only give it to French Canadians. Okay. <laughs> Japan, which is probably the most racist nation on earth, if they won't allow any immigrants in at all. And to give you an idea, Aoki, the golfer, who's listening to Japanese golfer, he's third generation Korean, and they still won't allow him citizenship. <laughs> and what's happening in Japan is you've got more and more old people, fewer and fewer young people to support them. It isn't working. And so you can see that if they allow development, the population situation would take care of itself. 1994, the Club of Rome in searching for a new enemy to unite us. We came up with the idea of pollution, the threat of global warming. I won't go beyond that. But, but the, uh, the global warming idea, of course, what they needed was something that was going to threaten the whole world. They had to overcome the individual nation states because they knew there would be a lot of nation states that would not go along with it. So they had to say, oh, the sky is falling, and it's falling all around the world, and therefore we need one world government to hold it up. Okay? And so that idea, the global warming, and by the way, water shortages is coming at you. You're already talking about peak water. And you know the water issue in Australia here better than most countries in the world. This is the guy that transmitted those ideas from the Club of Rome to the United Nations. I regret to tell you he's a Canadian by the name of Maurice Strong. He died just recently in China. Why was he in China? Because the American government wanted to put him in jail because he and his son and Kofi Annan and his son made money off the oil for food in Iraq crisis. And I have a, I have a photograph of a South Korean banker holding a check to the amount of $980,000 made out to Mr. Maury Strong, okay? And to give you an idea, he comes by his socialism uh, legitimately, if you can, if that's possible, but his, his aunt, Anna Strong, declared herself a Marxist in, at 15, and at 21 moved to China and had an affair with Mao Zedong. So Maury Strong and the connection with China and communism goes back quite a long way. Elaine Dewar, was interviewing him for a book, and he said, she, she said, what's the problem for the world? And he said, isn't the only hope for the planet that the industrialized nations collapse? Isn't it our responsibility to bring that about? And she said, well, you know, that's a pretty scary idea. Um, you know, why don't you run for politics? And he said, no, you can't do anything as a politician. I'm going to the UN where I can get all the money I want, not be accountable to anybody. And I love some of those, I think those real sleeper comments I like. Conrad Black, you know, the, the Canadian guy that got locked up by the Americans. They said to him one day, why aren't you in politics? He said, I don't need to be. 
<laughs> That's one of those sleep requirements that tells you all you really need to, need to know. So, so strong, of course, and here's the book, by the way, in which she's quoted by Elaine Dewar, Cloak of Green. Strong was using the UN as a platform to sell a global environment crisis and the global government's agenda. That's what he was all about. So he went to, uh, he went to the UN, he set up the United Nations Environment Program, organized the Rio Declaration of 1992, and then uh, if you look down on the left side of it, it says Political Agenda 21, Conference of the Parties. The Conference of the Parties is where the political decisions about climate and climate research and funding are made. They're currently at the top, I think it's 23, in Morocco. And remember, the King of Morocco gave Hillary $12 million. The, the connection's there. But the Conference of the Parties is critical. But they could only function based on the science that they're getting. And so he set up the scientific side of it through the World Meteorological Organization. And Strong knew that if he got the bureaucrats involved, he could then control the national weather agencies in every country, including BOM, including Environment Canada, all of them. And, and of course, they would then control the politicians. So he didn't try to control the politicians. He controlled the bureaucrats. And, of course, the Intergovernmental Panel of uh, Climate Change came out of that. Now, one of the things... Oh. Uh, I used to think commissions of inquiry are great. And I, I, I forgot, I think it was in, in, in Melbourne yesterday, I was going by, there was people saying, we need a, a royal commission of inquiry into, I don't know what it was, but they were out there plugging. And I used to think they were great. Say, go and get the politics out of the issue. Yeah. Until I got appointed to a commission myself, and it was a conflict over a very large lake in Canada. And the minister said, would you serve on the commission? I said, yeah. Okay, we had our first meeting. We got the terms of reference from the minister that were so narrow, it absolutely guaranteed you could only reach one conclusion. Yeah. Okay. And I said to the chairman of the commission, Mr. Duncan, I said, you could tell the minister... Either we get access to every bit of information, or I'm going to go to the media and say the minister is trying to predetermine the outcome of this commission. We got all the data, and guess what? The problem had been identified in 1876. The solutions had been proposed in 1876, and no politicians have done anything about it ever since, okay? And um, it's kind of like I used to collect um, acronyms, like, you know, uh, not in my backyard, NIMBY. Another one of favorite of mine was named, not at my expense. But the favorite of all was from the head of the uh, Hazardous Waste Committee for the province of Ontario. She said, the best one I've come across is ANINTO, A-N-I-N-T-O-O, -O, which stands for absolutely not in my term of office. <laughs> <laughs> Strong, limited, the IPCC, with this term of reference, a change of climate which is attributed directly or indirectly to human activity that alters the composition of the global atmosphere. The public think the IPCC are looking at climate in general, in everything. They are not. They are, they are deliberately narrowed down to only looking at human causes. And of course, the problem with that is you cannot determine the human effect unless you know the amount and cause of natural climate change. And that's been the problem from the beginning. You can't, can't, you've got to know one to even identify the other. Built into Agenda 21, this is principle 15, the precautionary principle. What's the precautionary principle? Well, that's the favorite of all the environmentalists. Well, shouldn't we act anyway? Shouldn't we do it anyway? Well, what if you're wrong? You know, we should act in. And that, that first came up when I appeared for the Canadian Parliament on the ozone issue. Another great deception. The ozone issue and the Montreal Protocol was a test run for the whole Kyoto Protocol. There never was a problem of, of ozone a difficulty. Absolutely false. No empirical evidence whatsoever. And by the way, the connections are Susan Solomon, who was at NOAA, was the person that said she had positive proof that CFCs were destroying the ozone. She didn't have it at all. But she had a peer-reviewed article that said it did. And Susan Solomon then went and became the lead uh, author 
on the, the physical science of the IPCC. So the connections there are across. But anyway, Agenda 21, it says, in order to protect the environment, the precautionary approach shall be widely applied by states according to their capabilities. Where there are threats of serious or irreversible damage, lack of full scientific certainty should not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures. Think back to that one I told you about, um, you know, they, they, they determine, they set this. So the first line allows you for socialism because what it's saying is it'll only be applied to those, problems or those states that can afford it. We're going to take their money and give it to the states that can't. It's a redistribution of wealth built right into the principle 15. And then it says full scientific certainty. Who decides that? They do. They do. They decide when there's full scientific certainty. So this, this of course, is, is all part of the, of the agenda. I won't, uh, I'll go through this very quickly. Uh, and I'm talking here about hypotheses. Uh, the public has completely different understanding of scientific terms than scientists understand. For example, the word skeptic to the public is a very negative, pejorative term. For scientists, if you're not a skeptic, you're not a scientist, period. Okay? You question everything. You question everything. And that's why I said that my comment with Bob Carton was we agree to disagree but not be disagreeable. <laughs> well, they set up this AGW hypothesis which was that said that CO2, CO2 is a greenhouse gas. If it increases, the temperature increases, and it will increase because humans are producing more of it. They then set about proving that hypothesis. But you don't do that. You set about disproving the hypothesis. You try to show that it doesn't work. And then if it doesn't work, you come up with a null hypothesis, say, well, it wasn't this, therefore it must be this. They don't even entertain the null hypothesis. Richard Lindzen said about the AGW hypothesis, the consensus was reached before the research had even begun. And he said that 30 years ago. And that's exactly what, what's been happening. Okay, I'll, I'll just flip through this quickly. Because I want to get to this graph. This came out in 1991. I remember the press conference in Paris where it was produced. And Pettit and Jowzel and the French uh, ice core data people uh, showed it. Jowzel said, don't rush to judgment on this. He said, yes, it appears to show CO2 going up and down and temperature going up and down. But he said, I'll point out to you, that's a 10 centimeter long graph of 420,000 years. And not only that, but the data has been smoothed to a 70 year smoothing average. In other words, you virtually eliminate all the variability, which tells you a great deal about the mechanisms and causes, okay? So he warned about that, but of course they rushed to judgment. Within five years, Fisher and others were saying, hey, the temperature's changing before the CO2. Hey. Hey. Okay, in complete contradiction to, uh, to their basic assumption about CO2 gases. All right, I, I wanted to show this. This is a systems diagram showing how complex the weather is. All of the variables I've underlined in red. This is a very important point because see, the IPCC have kept everything focused on temperature. But for humans in the short and medium term, what the precipitation is going to do is far more important. And, and Tony and I have talked about this a lot. If you think the temperature data is less than adequate, the precipitation data is even worse. In fact, they did a study in Africa and concluded that they didn't even reach the World Meteorological Organization requirements for number of stations. So the, the percent is important. But look what they've done. I've underlined in blue CO2. They picked one little gas out of all of that complexity of variables. So that's the problem. And of course, I, want, I try to get the public to understand that. Tony mentioned a little bit about the computer models. This is from the textbook that I wrote on, on climate. And it shows an explosion of the computer model. They're actually mathematical models that divide the world up into grids. And, um, and then, of course, 85% of the world, we've got no data, which Tony was referring to. 70% of the oceans, 20% uh, of the land's forests, we've got virtually no weather stations. 19% desert, virtually no weather stations. 
And then the most important one that's missed out, grasslands. Grasslands is one of the most important ecozones in the world, very important for Australia, virtually ignored. The amount of gas movement in and out of the grasses is, is, is virtually unknown. That's the surface data. As you go above the surface, you've got even less data. We know virtually nothing. And I, I know for, for five years, we had a tower outside of Winnipeg. We had weather instruments every 200 feet. It was unbelievable the difference in the weather and the climate at each 200 foot level. I couldn't believe it. The only thing I'd seen with as much variability with change in height was when we were doing anti submarine work and measuring water temperatures because we wanted to know where the submarines were hiding in sound layers. And so the variation in temperature in the oceans is as complex as it is in the lower atmosphere. So you can't model that. Tony said they make it up. What they decided was that if they had one station, it was representative of the weather and climate for a 1,200-kilometer radius area. Oh, oh. So I've drawn 1,200-kilometer radiuses on North America. You see the one on the right side, which is centered on, on the southern Great Lakes. Notice that it includes the subarctic climate of, of James Bay and the subtropical climate of North Carolina in the same area. And then they tell you that the station at the center of that represents that whole area. I mean, it is just unbelievable. You wouldn't even get away with this in a grade 10 research paper. So you can see the, the difficulties that, that are involved. Uh, I'll go through this very quickly. The, the IPCC narrowed it down to looking at 11 variables. All human causes, this is from the AR3 report. On the right-hand side, they had a column that said level of scientific understanding. Out of the 11 variables they had, only two were high. All the rest were low or very low. So even out of the variables they were looking at, they didn't know very much. The same thing applies here. This is AR5. It really hasn't changed much at all. And I describe what they're doing here is they're looking, they've got 11 pieces of a 5,000 piece puzzle, and they're saying they finished the puzzle with those 11 pieces. That's effectively what they've done. Okay, very quickly, um, CO2, of course, became the focus. The left diagram is the, all of the gases in the atmosphere. The little yellow portion expanded to the greenhouse gases. The yellow is the CO2, and the black portion in the bottom right of the yellow there is the human addition of CO2. And they're telling you that since 1950, that little black piece has controlled virtually all weather and climate. And it is just absolutely stunning. This shows it even better. Why did they ignore water vapor? Yeah, they, they acknowledged, they said, oh yeah, humans produce water vapor. See the steam and so on. But the amount we produce is so small relative to the total amount in the atmosphere, we'll just ignore it. And I'm telling you, if water vapor varies by 1%, that equals all of the effect that CO2 could have. Okay? But we leave it out of the formula. Tony, I think, showed this one. This is uh, John Christie's presentation to Congress. The um, uh, climate model predictions against the actual uh, data in the bottom. And by the way, the IPCC have been wrong since the very first report. The first predictions they made in the 1990 report were out by 400 <laughs> percent. What they did was they stopped calling the predictions, started calling them projections. And they started calling them scenarios, okay? So what you're seeing there is the climate model scenarios, but even those were wrong. And very quickly about how they, um, instead of correcting their science, because you can sum up science in one word, the ability to predict. If your predictions are wrong, your science is wrong. End of story. Mm -hmm. Well, here, what, what I show here is the warming, and Tony uh, pointed this out, the warming up till about 1998, and then the leveling of the trend after 1998. Um, all of, the, all of a sudden, it went from global warming to climate change. And it was amazing how quickly they achieved that shift of the terminology. And um, uh, I know you won't be able to read this at the bottom. I'll read it out for you. But this is from the leaked emails of East Anglia. It's a 2004 leaked uh, email from the Climatic Research Unit from the Men's Temple Center, which did the PR, by the way, for the, these people. It says, in my experience, global warming 
increasing is already a bit of a public relations problem with the media. Okay, remember, we had those cold winters and people were saying, what's going on here? And I used to jokingly tell them, global warming is another undelivered government promise. <laughs> but here's the response, the bottom of the response by Bo Yellen, who is the Swedish chief climate negotiator. He said, I agree with Nick that climate change might be a better late lady than global warming. So in other words, that shift was conscious. What they should have done as scientists is say, no, we need to go back and, and look at our, our climate science. David Deming, I don't know if, if uh, Tony knows David, but I, I've known him for about 30 years. Um, this is an email. Uh, he wrote an article in Science in 1995, and he said, with the publication of the article in Science in 1995, I gained significant credibility in the community of scientists working on climate change. They thought I was one of them, someone who would pervert science in the service of social and political causes. So one of them let his guard down, that was Jonathan Overbeck. Uh, he said, a major person working in the area of climate change and global warming sent me an astonishing email that said, Thank you so much. we have to get rid of the medieval war period. Okay. In other words, we have to rewrite the history. And I can tell you that Michael Mann had produced the algorithms and the, the, the mathematics for his hockey stick when he was at, at Virginia and he submitted as a doctoral thesis. The committee rejected it. His committee rejected it. And he sat there for two years and then all of a sudden, and I, I apologize, I forgot the name, but somebody at Penn State who was a, promoting the global warming invited man to Penn State. Man arrived at Penn State. His thesis was approved within two months, and within another four months, he was a lead author on the IPCC reports. So you, you see the, the kinds of things. And by the way, that's how Hansen got to be head of NASA GIS, because Senator Worth and Senator Gore said, we need somebody, a scientist, to come out here and say they're 99% certain that humans are causing warming. And Worth's right. You can read it on Frontline. It's right on the web. Worth said, we found this guy at NASA by the name of Hansen, and he very bravely was willing to come before our committee. Do you know what they did? They went to the ware office and said, what's the hottest day of the year in, in Washington? That's the day they held the hearings. And then what did they do? The night before, they went in and they opened the windows and shut off the air conditioning. So everybody at the hearing was sitting there sweating, and here's this guy talking about global warming. <laughs> the whole thing was orchestrated. I mean, it really is frightening. Really, it's frightening. Okay, there's the graph that, um, that Tony showed you that it's called the 7C graph in the 1990 report. I know that this came from Hubert Lamb because he told me. I, I, hate, I hate doing that name dropping. My mother always used to say, you know, she I was just telling the Queen last week how much I'd hate name droppers. <laughs> <laughs> there's the hockey stick, of course, that came out of it. Yeah. I've done a lot of work on tree rings all across Canada, and in fact, the temperature data that I created were used as a regression formula against tree ring data. Tree rings are about precipitation. They are not about temperature, except in extreme circumstances. And one of the extreme circumstances is the bristlecone pine in the California mountains, and of course that set, where they, they said, don't use it. That's the set that Michael Mann used, okay? Mm -hmm. And, and so, of course, he completely rewrote the history. So, uh, Mad's broad claims of academic exemption from freedom of information due to the proprietary nature of his work on the hockey stick. I, I just want to, a, a little story, and, and I, I'm sorry we're going on so long with this, but it's so important to get the context of all of this. Because I was at a, a conference in Bismarck, North Dakota, back about 35 years ago. Avril Harriman, who had been the first U.S. representative to the U.N., was the speaker. And he, he, he did something quite uh, remarkable. He said, I, I'm going to tell you what's going to be happening over the next 60 years. And he took, a, a, actually took a pen out of his pocket, and he said, if I sell you that pen, you have the pen, I no longer have the pen. But if I have an idea, and I sell you the idea, you've got the idea, but I still got the idea. 
And he said, the challenge for society over the next 60 years is how do I make money out of an idea without immediately selling it? Uh, it's devalued. And of course, they came up with this intellectual property. Yep. And the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Plan that Obama's got, 20% of it is devoted to this proprietary rights and copyrights and so on. And, and so Matt, of course, appeared before the judge and said, no, I don't have to give up my data. It's my intellectual property. And the judge agreed with him. The judge agreed with him, even though Cuccinelli, the attorney general, said, hey, hang on a minute. The public paid for your research. And you've used your data to convince the, the politicians of a policy that influences everybody. And you're saying you don't have to tell us what you did or how you did it? This is outrageous. By the way, one of the scenes I'm going to use in my law or my law case. You only ever done that high school math exam? What was the standard instruction? Show your work. Show your work. Right? Because you might have got the answer from somebody else or just stumbled across it. So anyway, uh, that's a very important part of what's going on. Mark Stein, of course, produced this book, A Disgrace to the Profession. Yeah. I told my lawyer, look, just give a copy of this to every juror and, and it'll be the end of the case. But of course, uh, when if we did that, that would be classified as hearsay. I'll just show you this graph very quickly. This is the uh, temperature uh, from the Greenland ice core for the last 10,000 years. Tony had introduced it in a couple of his graphs. On the right-hand side, you can see the current temperature right on that line. Prior to that, of course, you see the little ice age that we've just emerged from. You see the medieval warm period. But what I want you to notice is that for almost 97% of the last 10,000 years, the Earth has been warmer than it is today. And that, it, it's, you know, they're telling you. And remember... The polar bears survived all of that. Thank you very much. Okay, and that's an important part of this idea. Now, just for empirical evidence, um, this is a photograph that Professor Ritchie took. It's actually in one of Lamb's books. It's a, it's a white spruce, a Picea glauca, and it's radiocarbon dated at 5,000 years old. For a, a white spruce, a fact I mentioned, to grow at that latitude, the temperature of the world had to be three degrees Celsius warmer than at present. And not only that, but that's 100 kilometers north. And I can tell you right at the tree line like, like right now, you cut down a tree that's, that's about two inches across, it's 120 years old. You need a microscope to see the tree rings. So it gives you an idea of how much warmer it was for that tree to grow. That's empirical evidence. Okay, I'll just show you very quickly. This is Australia's mega droughts, and they, they're highlighted in orange. You notice the number of mega droughts back in the medieval warm period, a couple recently. But really, as Tony said, business as usual, weather as usual, no, no matter which record you look at. And here's the long-term um, aridity of changes in the West. Uh, in fact, a slight uh, decline, but really no, nothing of any significance, all normal. Here's uh, winter-spring rainfall in Australia starting in 1900. Nothing significant or important here. Uh, I mean, you could pick any trend out of it you want, but this is the um, global... Uh, measurement of severe storms no change whatsoever but the public are being told more storms worse than ever it's the end of the world absolute nonsense no matter what record you go yale university decided to do a test a high school test of american knowledge, american public knowledge of climate they did it like a grade 10 class test and they gave it out this is the results 77 percent got a d or an f Okay, so you start talking about greenhouse or global warming, they don't even know what you're talking about. They don't care what you're talking about. It's not an issue to them. And that's why, of course, it's very low on the scale. Um, the 97% figure, I think everybody's familiar with that, the, the, the involvement of the University of Queensland, yeah. the 11,944 papers have used. But by their own definition, only 41 agreed with the hypothesis. Oh. So the actual results is 0.3%. But you see, that plays into the consensus argument. Mm -hmm. And the argument, again, remember I mentioned that skeptics was a term that had different connotation 
for the public and in science. Consensus has no application in science whatsoever. It's purely a political term. And I believe that to the point that when they came out with the Oregon petition, where they got 33,000 scientists saying, you know, we all agree global warming is us. I wouldn't sign it because I said, your consensus is no better than their consensus. And, and so, you know, they're that Timball, that contrarian, there he goes again, you know, but, but, but you either believe something or you don't. And, and so you can see that. Uh, this is the most significant quote, I think, that I've seen in, in the, my 40 years in climate. Um, because what I would argue with you is 97% of scientists have never even looked at the science of the climate. They've never looked at the IPCC reports. And, and so it's meaningless. This is Klaus, er, uh, Klaus Eckhart Pulse, a German physicist and meteorologist. And he said, 10 years ago, I simply parroted what the IPCC told us. One day, one day I started checking the facts and data. First I started with a sense of doubt, but then I became outraged when I discovered that much of what the IPCC and the media were telling us was sheer nonsense and was not even supported by any scientific facts and measurements. To this day, I still feel shame that as a scientist, I made presentations of their science without first checking the facts. That is a stunning uh, uh, comment to make and gives you an idea of what's going on. Um, I, we, we could go on all night, but there's so much I want to tell you. But this is the Milankovitch effect, the changing tilt of the Earth, the changing orbit of the Earth, the changing uh, equal. Um, and um, again, it goes back to the idea of changes gradual over long periods of time. So you could students, you're still being told the orbit of the Earth is a fixed elliptical orbit, but it changes dramatically all the time. It's being changed by the planetary uh, pull of Jupiter, plan, uh, gravitational pull of Jupiter. And I, I was talking about this, and, and by the way, one of the ways you see it is humans create calendars. Calendars are fixed, but nature isn't. Mm. Nature keeps changing, and so we have to adjust our calendars to keep up with nature. And in 1782, the British government said, we're going to add 11 days to the calendar. In other words, we're going to shorten the year by 11 days. And I always said to people, you know, there were, everybody was outraged. In fact, there were riots in England. They thought the government had shortened their lives by 11 days. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was teaching courses at Stony Mountain Penitentiary north of Winnipeg. Because I wanted to have a captive audience for a change. <laughs> and I said, I said, you know, the, the government shortened the year by 11 days and everybody was outraged. And one of the prisoners said, I know a group that weren't. That's <laughs> all <laughs> relative. But um, none of this is in their computer models. Milankovitch is not in their computer model. And yet it's changing the relationship of sun earth uh, every year. The other one, of course, is the um is the Slinsmark theory. And one of the problems we've had in climate science, apart from cherry picking, but a very legitimate problem is that you have you can see correlations, but you don't know you don't have a cause and effect. And I used to preach to my students about that. I said you must be very careful. But just because you've got a correlation doesn't mean there's a cause and effect. My favorite example was, I said that Diet Coke causes obesity because more obese people drink Diet Coke than any other group in society. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and, and basically what, what, um, uh, what, what uh, Svensmark did, and, and by the way, I should tell you with Milankovic, I went to conferences in the 80s, and if you mention Milankovic, they threw me out of the room. The first conference I went to, 1989, somebody mentioned Milankovic, he wasn't challenged. So you see how recent so much of this stuff is. Svensmark, of course, we knew that there was a relationship between sunspot numbers and temperature. We knew that when there were more sunspots, the Earth was warmer, less sunspots, the Earth was cooler. But we didn't have uh, a cause and effect. Svensmark provided that cause and effect. What he showed is cosmic radiation from space, is controlled by the Earth, the sun's magnetic field. And as the sun's magnetic field changes, the number of sunspots change. That's the relationship there, okay? So that determines the number of condensation nuclei in the lower atmosphere. Therefore, it varies the amount of cloud cover at low levels. 
And the, one of the graphs that shows that, here you can see the, uh, the blue line is the uh, cloud cover, and the red line is the variation in, in cosmic intensity. When it's a very, very high correlation. Okay, just almost at the end here. Uh, the, the sunspot numbers, of course, vary in. Um, the, the, the image is a painting by Jan Griffier, who was living in London in 1683, when there was three feet of ice on the Thames River. Okay, and um, you could see uh, Westminster Abbey on the left, St. Paul's Cathedral, and you see a, a, a medieval ice sphere down the middle of the ice. Queen Elizabeth and her court skated on the Thames quite regularly. The last time that they had enough ice for an ice sphere was in 1836. Some wag has said that the ice doesn't form anymore because they built the Houses of Parliament in front of the Westminster Abbey, and the hot air from the politicians has stopped the ice. <laughs> <laughs> the sunspot cycles, the reason that people like Uzoskin and other uh, experts are saying we're into a cooling, sun, uh, sun cycle 24 yep. has got a, a very low number of sunspots. We're almost equal to what we had in 1800 and 1820, and so the global temperature will decline with that. My hero, Vaclav Klaus of the Czech Republic, he appeared at the, yes, yeah, very great guy. He, he was the keynote speaker in New York at the first Heartland Conference, and he got up and he said, we just lived through 70 years of communism. Why the hell would you want to go back to that? <laughs> and the place erupted, it just erupted. And, um, and by the way, he did a second term, and of course, then they trumped up charges and tried to put him in jail uh, because of, of his views on things. Yeah. And, 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 and he wrote this book, yeah. this is a fabulous title, Blue Planet in Green Shackles. I just love that title. And then he says, what is in danger, climate or freedom? Yeah. And that, of course, is what Malcolm Roberts and why Tony and, and I are here, because that's really what climate and science is being used to enslave the people and and you can see that that happening and i finish up with my two little publications the deliberate corruption of climate science and i just brought out the, the first one is fairly long and, and and very detailed because i knew the academics were going to attack it and i appreciate all of you that read it but as one lawyer said to me he said it was i enjoyed it but it was a slog and so well, okay but the, this one on the right is a much shorter version. Uh, it's human caused global warming. I've done it in a journalistic approach. Who, what, when, where, how, and why. And it's 100 pages. And I've already had it reviewed by people who don't know the science and said, yeah, I follow the story now. It makes a lot of sense to me. So I just thought I brought that to your attention. Thank you for your patience. Uh, tonight, um, I, I, I very, well, I, I'm very aware of this. I'm very worried that somebody once said the mind can absorb what the behind can endure. <laughs> and I suspect you're close to that. <laughs>